All right, y'all, we are live. We are recording. You're in the right spot for today's installment for our small business week. We're here to thrive together. And I'm so excited for our next guest, um, Patrick Hagan. He's going to be talking about diving into how to build and not only maintain business, but also how to make sure that you are succeeding as well. This is going to be not only a great session, but also we're going to be just learning a lot of different things from him. Um, he and I talked a little bit earlier as we came on to do a dry run and just go over some things. He's very well-spoken. He's amazing at what he does. He looks great today. Amy <laughs> got that started as well. And I hope you brought your notebooks. I hope you're here to take notes because I surely am. Um, because Pat Patrick's insights are going to be golden. They're going to be key and they're going to set us on a path for this week um, as we continue to learn from these amazing business owners, these amazing people in the LinkedIn GoDaddy small business group. And I'm going to give a round of applause for him. And I hope you're all screaming and clapping for him on the other side of that camera as well. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Patrick Hagan. Patrick? Jeffrey, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, definitely um, glad that I look good today. So I, like I said, I must must look different other days. But anyway, um, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. You know, everybody has a full-time job. This is the middle of some people's day, whether you're West Coast, whether you're Central Time Zone like myself, you're East Coast, you could be around the world. Thank you for making the time. I want to thank GoDaddy for giving us the platform as a group to get together and share and collaborate and connect. Um, I want to thank everybody who's spoken before me and those that are going to come after me. Um, phenomenal presentations, great information. And I belong to a lot of groups on LinkedIn and there is no other group like this. And so if you're, if you're part of the community, great. I'm glad to, glad to call you one of my, one of my associates. If you're not, I encourage you to join our community because the beautiful thing about this event we do, this small business week celebration, we do this all the time. We call them meetups. And what I always tell people is joining our community is not going to make your business world smaller, but participating in the community is going to make it a small world so that your connection around the world is one Zoom call away. So, you know, whether you tuned in and you heard Jonathan talk about building an online presence, he didn't set out to do that. That wasn't, and it wasn't by mistake, but it was by passion. Jonathan has a wonderful dog in his life named Noodle. Noodle's passed away, but Jonathan enjoyed the time during COVID, bones or no bones, and it created a million followers. But he didn't set out with a goal, I'm going to create a million followers. But he did something he felt strongly about. And that's really what this is about. And he was followed by Johnny Romero, who gave a tremendous presentation, not only on diversity in the workplace, but perseverance in his life and translating what he loves into something he can do it as a business. And I'm going to tap into a lot of the stuff that Johnny talked about. That was followed by Alicia, who gave us tools we need in the confusing world of how does AI fit in with humans and our interaction there. And then we had the kickoff this morning with Adam Griggs, the blueprint to how to build a successful business, clarify as a very successful business. And all of these all of these speakers in this sequence are put together for a reason because you need to have tools. Then you need to know how to use them. And I'm going to spend a lot of time in the how to. But one thing that we all share is this community, is this passion, is this togetherness. So that if you reached out to, to any one of these folks, Jonathan, Johnny, Alicia, Adam, and you said, hey, I, I want to figure out what it was that Patrick was saying about this. They might be able to help. You might come to me and say, I want to know how to use, how do you use AI in your business? Well, I'm going to be smart enough to point you back to Alicia and say, here's what I use, but she'll know what you should use. So this community is our common thread. And I encourage you all, if you're not part of the community, become part of the community. And then reach out and connect. Find a buddy. Find someone you go to the meetings with together. Pair up with me. I don't, I love engaging with our group. So I'm here today to talk to you about creating better outcomes. But before I do, I want to tell you a little bit about my story, because a lot of you 
interact with me now, today's version of Patrick Kagan, the broken in version, the person who's been kind of roughed up by life. Many of you don't know about that. So I'm not going to go into a, a sob story, but I think you should know that I come from what I describe as very humble beginnings. Put other ways, I grew up dirt poor, very little means, very little resources. You know, at the age of eight, um, I our our household was very poor. I gave my parents my $25 savings account and they took it. They needed it. I got two paper routes and I earned $3.50 a week from riding my bike around town through storms, whatever it took, delivering papers. I gave them that money, $3.50 a week, and they took it. And it paid for our groceries, paid for our utilities. And this pattern continued. And it continued throughout my lifetime. But I got to high school and I realized I'm paying private tuition for myself and my sisters to go to a, a private high school. I'm paying our groceries, I'm paying our utilities, I'm paying our mortgage, and I'm paying for our car. I'm paying for everything. Now you can imagine what kind of environment someone must grow up in, what that household must be like. And that's a different story for a different time. But it's hard. It was hard. And it's very easy to get beat up by your circumstances and actually to believe that your circumstances are who you are. So I came away from that experience with two really important lessons. Jeffrey recommended, you know, if you have a notepad, write things down. You're going to want to write things down. I'm going to be asking lots of questions that you need to answer for yourself. So you're going to want to write some things down. But two of the lessons I learned is that in the family I grew up in, without clear leadership, there's chaos. And it happens in your life every day. And that happens in your business every day. Chaos is not good for anybody. The other thing I learned is that my future is my choice. My future was not yet written. My future wasn't paying the way all the time, stuck in a bad situation. My future was up to me. And those of you that know that I served in the Army, the Army was a better way for me. The Army was a way for me to go to college. And at the time, getting a college education was your way up. And there's many more ways now than back in the 1980s when I went to, when I went to school. But I chose to join the military, to join the infantry, frontline soldiering, because that was better than what I was sitting in, and I wanted a better way. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to something Johnny Romero said in his, in his presentation. He said, the common denominator that we all have is one's tolerance for pain. He's absolutely dead on with that. For me, my change happened for me when I was fed up. I had exceeded my own pain tolerance. I was done. I wasn't going to be that way anymore. I was going to be better. And in the 1980s, there were no college campus visits. I didn't know what college was. Joining the infantry was one step away from going to prison. They didn't treat you with respect and love like they do nowadays. It was hard. So I was going to prison to go find a better way in my mind. Now, that's not what happened. But in other words, common denominator for all of us is our tolerance for pain. And you will change when you've had enough pain. And if you don't change, you just haven't had enough pain yet. So I learned that without hardship, there can be no heroes. It's hard to be the hero of your own story. And for a while, I had to be my own role model, if you will. But life's too big for one person. I learned the value of community. And Adam talked a lot about community today. Finding others who have been there, who can show me the way, who can give me some shortcuts, who can make it easier. The load is always heavy. But more people helping you lift that load makes it a lot easier. So I learned hardship creates heroes. I also learned there's no such thing as success or failure, only outcomes. And it, life is like a science experiment. So in science, you conduct a study and you get so far. And some people say you failed. But what happens is your outcome wasn't what you thought. You go back to the beginning and you recreate until you can change one thing subtly and see if you can go farther. So I don't look at things as success or failure. I look at everything as an outcome. Now, Johnny also described wealth as more than money, and I love that. I use the word abundance. Abundance, in my mind, has nothing to do with wealth. And let me be real clear. I make a living by helping my friends and my community make a better living. So yes, money is important. There is an economic system we all live within. 
but I would rather make you more abundant in your, in your family, in your friends, in your community, in your business. And yes, I want to help make you rich along the way. But abundance is, is what I think my word is for what Johnny described as wealth being more than money. So I'm here today to talk to you about three words. I think of them as action verbs, but three words, when you stitch them together, they're going to awaken, awaken the abundance in your world. And that is creating better outcomes. So if you don't mind, I'm done with my story and I want to share with you how you can create better outcomes. Let me just get back to sharing my screen. All right, so let me know, Jeffrey, if you can, do you see my company logo right now? I can see it. All right. And are you seeing now better outcomes? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So if my slides buffer a little bit, let me know. I'll slow down. But the idea is we're going to create better outcomes. You'll see at the bottom of the slide, my calendar link. If you need to get a hold of me, you can get me there. But what's nice about this idea of better outcomes, this could be, you might not be looking to be an entrepreneur. You not, might not be looking to start a business. This could be in your own individual career aspirations. You could be an entrepreneur, a solopreneur, you could be in a small business or some personal aspect of your life. I have people come to me like, I want to lose the last 10 pounds. Not necessarily my specialty, but sometimes there's areas I can help them with or at least point them to the right person. But this is an area where, um, you know, it can happen anywhere. So it's not just for those that are in small business. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You can write them down, but if nothing else, just answer them for yourself. So I want to know, have you ever felt stuck? Have you ever ended up in the same place? You start in one direction and you end up in the same place. I had someone come to me recently and she said, I want to hire you because I'm tired of getting hired into the same job at a different company. That's mind, that's mind blowing that she can come to that realization. She was repeating a pattern of getting bad jobs, but she was good at getting a job. So have you ever in your own life ended up in the same place and you didn't mean to? Have you ever tried to start in some direction and you end up in a different place? Sometimes it happens in a conversation. You mean to ask one question, and you ask another, and the conversation goes in a different direction. But this can happen in your, in your business life. Or have you ever enthusiastically started something just to end up discouraged? And if you could have answered yes to any one of these things, then you're here to get three steps to a better outcome. So my focus today I will talk about your what, and I will talk about your why. Those are buzzwords in a way to me. I'm going to talk about the how-to, because many times we have these presentations, and you walk away, and you feel good, but then you don't know how to do something. And my goal is to help you create some clarity. And I love this image. I use this image quite a bit, and I always say, movement in the fog is not the same as progress. I've been there myself. Believe me, I'm facing this bridge many times in my life. So let's talk about these three steps to better outcomes. Now, and Jeffrey, I'll have you read. I'm gonna have I'm gonna ask this question. I'd love for people to give a quick answer and see where we get. So I always I always like to point out that there are these three steps, but every step is preceded by a starting point. So I would like to know what do you think is the starting point before you begin taking these three steps? So maybe people could just put in the chat. I can't see the chat. Jeffrey, you could read one or two to me if you could. Maybe not uh, the yet. why, wanting a change in your life. Alicia said the why. And then yeah. Amy said, wanting a change in your life, wanting to earn more money. Uh -huh. um, I would say also, like, just speaking candidly from my experience and like also wanting to be involved in this conversation is yeah. um, to, wanting to be better. Absolutely. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm living proof. Look, dude, I've been, I mean, that was. That was a long time ago, and to this day, there I still feel pain. I give seminars on forgiveness, and forgiveness in my world was letting go of the emotion that controlled my decision making. It wasn't forgetting the sting that slapped me. So, yes, wanting a better way is absolute motivation. But I have something different. Adam touched on it perfectly this morning. It's like he read my slides and teed me up for success. So, the starting point for everybody is mindset, and he mentioned mind shift, mindset to mind shift. Now. I geek out about a lot of things. I love science fiction. 
I love data, which I think is why Amy Benzowitz loves me. I love data. I love looking at data and, and creating the story that comes out, the pictures that come out of that data. You'll see a lot of my promotions. I love the visuals. It's how I think. But I absolutely geek out on things that have to do with mindset. So I have some things I want to share with you on the power of mindset and how this is going to have, this is the number one thing before any step you take for your outcomes. But I'm going to give you some life hacks, some really easy things you can put in your pocket and take with you when we're done right now. So the average person has 70,000 thoughts every day. And there's only 86,400 seconds in a day. So that, you know, if you were, if you were aware of every thought you had, you'd go crazy. You couldn't get anything done because you'd be so focused on what you're thinking. So obviously lots of this goes on behind the scenes and th there's science to show how people came up with this and there's varying numbers, but the, for the, for my geeking out and all the things I read, the average was 70,000 thoughts a day. That's about a, a thought a second. 80% of those thoughts are negative. Now, in this study, they equate neutral to be equal to negative, okay? So your brain fires a different way when it's a positive thought, but neutral and negative measure the same. So neutral could be if you're talking to me and you say, Pat, I didn't gain any weight this week, or I maintained my weight this week. I'm using weight loss as an example. Well, what, what your mind is hearing is you didn't lose any weight, right? So 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 you, your brain fires in a different way, and it sets off emotions and feelings and memories from a different reservoir. It doesn't set them off from a positive. Now, 80% of your 70,000 thoughts are negative or neutral. 95% of those are on repeat. So you're repeating things in your head all the time and you don't even know it. Okay, so I always ask people when I do these, these seminars, you know, what do you think we should do? And people are gonna have a positive mindset, gotta change our mindset. You don't have to re you don't have to have a, a change of mindset. You have to redirect. If you can redirect your thoughts, what happens is you redirect your behaviors. And if you redirect your behaviors, you redirect your outcomes because your mind is malleable. Your mind will redirect. So what does redirecting your thoughts, behaviors, and outcomes mean? So a lot of times when I ask people, how can you get you know, a redirected mindset? They'll say, do yoga, take a deep breath, read a book, call a friend, hug a puppy. Yeah, those are good tactics, right? I'm talking about the idea of, you know, if you have this, if you imagine this animation playing out in front of you, it's negative talk all the time. If you're just simply able to put it on mute, you can let it move around all you want. But if you don't hear it, it has less control. So here's my life hack. This is a really cool thing. The way to, to redirect your thoughts is to do problem solving. Now, as an individual, as a person, this could be something as simple as do a crossword puzzle, do a wordle, do Sudoku. These are really simple ways. You're not meditating. You're not deep breathing. You're problem solving. You're engaging your mind in solving a problem. And the bigger the problem, the more it engages your mind to solve, the, the harder the problem is, the more you can buy it those negative thoughts. Now, the other thing, now think about this with a, with, a, with a business or a group. It could be a group of two or three. If you get a group of people tasked with a problem, let's say it has to do with your business or your customers or a process, they don't have time to bitch around the water cooler. They don't have time to listen to them own, their own mind going off. They have time to solve the problem and use their skills for something meaningful and productive. This is a great way when people talk about creating culture. You let the employees or the people you lead create that and you let them solve big problems because guess what? They're smart. And if they're like Jeffrey was talking about this, we were talking ahead you know, before this, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you or better at certain tasks than you. Let them solve problems and let them know they're important. Here's the next hack. Rewards. Now, there's a book I'll point you towards. It's called The Scarcity Mind. And early on, probably the first 40 pages or less, he talks about the discovery of the scarcity loop we have in our brain. And in Las Vegas in the 70s, slot machines were on the downturn. They were losing money for Vegas. You'd pull one slot arm, it would rotate one line, and you'd hope to get three cherries and you'd win. And the payoff was bad. So they realized if they made a digital screen where you push a button that has several layers of 
things happening, several outcomes that can happen. Even something they call a loss disguised as a win, a celebration of something or a smaller win, you bet a dollar, you win a dime, was perceived in your mind as a win. So with rewards, if you can make them rich in opportunity, in other words, there's a lot of opportunity for rewards, you can make them unpredictable in nature. I used to get my kids just because, my, my three daughters, just because flowers. Made them feel great, right? Rewards because. And they repeat quickly. So a lot of times employers get away from something like this. So they do years of service. You have to wait five years, you get a plaque. You get a lot of people saying, I want it in my paycheck. Keep your plaque, right? Doesn't repeat quickly. Or here's what's worse. You do nothing and their paycheck is their reward. So guess what? People are in a great mood on payday. But then they're like, hey, this isn't worth it. This job sucks, you know? So if your paycheck is reward, you're not rewarding people. And if you're trying to come up with a re reward program, you're still failing. You need to involve the employees in problem solving and what rewards you and, and put that around them and get things out of their way. So those are my mindset hacks. Those are easy things. And you can do it with yourself. Get yourself solving problems if you feel like you're stuck, right? What, do you, what are your rewards? Is your reward to brainstorm and to do another post and to make another bunch of cold calls or handle a problem with billing? If that's rewarding to you, go for it. Do it. I'll hire you. I don't like doing that. I like the rewarding stuff. So those are some mind hacks, okay? So now let's get into what are my three steps to better outcomes, okay? And I can't see the, the comments. So hopefully if you have questions, Jeffrey, if something comes up that's relevant to a slide, stop me so I can talk about it. You got it for sure. Okay. Okay, cool. So um, three steps to better outcomes. So what are these three steps? Okay. And here's what they are very simply. Clarity, vision, focus. So if, you're, if, you, are, if you look at the, the answers to your questions early on, if you felt stuck, if you started down a path and you ended up in the wrong place, right? Nine times out of 10, you started without clarity. You started moving. So people get really confused on tactics as strategy and then what strategy, right? So tactics. You see a lot of people, I got my to-do list. I checked it off my list. I did this. I created, the, I created the sales contest. I created the newsletter. Those are tactics. Those are steps. But, but strategy is vision. Where are we going? Where are we trying to go? So clarity of what is it you do, right? And in, when you, when you, when I talk to folks and they're like, I want to write a book, Pat, you wrote a book. What should I do? I got a great title or I don't know where to begin writing. I, I can't think of chapter one. It's too granular, right? So you, you, you don't want to have a title of a book. You don't want to build a website. You don't want to have the product name. You don't want to even come up with a price until you have some clarity on what, what you're doing. So what I tell people is you're not wrong, you're just out of sequence. You're working on vision or focus things when you, we have to go back to clarity. People don't necessarily like to hear that, but remember, I make a living by making my friends make a better living. So it's hard to read the label from inside your own box. My job is to own the outside of the box and read the label to hold you to what you said was important and then point out, when you're getting into a focus area, when first you have to go back to clarity. So now here's where you want to start writing down some questions and some answers. These next questions are all for you. So when you're trying to figure out, I want to create a better outcome. So a lot of times, you know what you don't want. You know you don't want to work for a certain company or a certain boss. It doesn't mean you have to start a business. It doesn't mean you have to change a job. But you have to talk about your happiness gaps. Where do my happiness gaps exist? Is it with the employer is it with my boss? Probably. Is it with my pay? Maybe. But happiness gaps. And, and again, happiness is not bring your dog to work or you know casual Fridays like it used to be or whatever it would be. But the, the, the things that truly make you feel fulfilled, okay? Fulfillment is different than happiness. So here are some questions. If you're looking for a job and you're going to talk to an employer, if you're starting a business, if you've been in a business but you realize... I'm getting myself in a place I don't want to be. Here's the first question. What do I do? And I ask everybody to, to bear with me on my limitations. Put it into one sentence. That's the first practice of clarity. 
Can I say in one sentence, this is what I do. So if I'm looking for a job, this is what I do for others. This is what I'll do for you. Because you can reverse that. What will you do to support me? Right? But what do I do? Who do I do it for? Especially when you're in business. Who do I do this for? This is what I do. Who do I do it for? So when, as an example from me, when I go to networking events, and I'll spend probably a good couple hours before I get there refocusing myself, repurposing my vision and getting clarity on who is it I want to talk to? What do they look like? Who are they? So I don't waste time. What is it I do? Who do I do it for? So you hear me say, I'm Patrick Kagan. I work with frontline sales and sales leadership. And what I do is help those folks with the revenue challenges they face. If you know people like that, I'd love if you could introduce me to them. You'd be surprised. I go, well, that's me. And I'm like, well, I know because I preloaded myself to talk to you because you're the one, but then they know three other people like them. So what do I do? Who do I do it for? So that's what you want to write down. You can do it now, or at least if nothing else, write down the questions so you can do it later. Here's the next question. What problem do I solve? So Johnny talked about the tolerance for pain, right? It's important to know that you are solving a problem and who suffers from that problem. I always say, who's got the pain? And my, you know, my analogy in my head is, I imagine I've got something to take care of toothaches. That's the problem I solve. I got to go out and find people who've got toothaches or at least have teeth, right? So what do I do? Who do I do it for? What problem or problems do I solve? But again, one sentence, keep it to one problem. And who suffers from that problem? That's the, People talk about scaling their business. You need to target your business, okay? Scale is way down the road. Target. You got to stay in business. Don't talk about scaling things. I got to find out who owns this problem. What pain does this problem cause the owner of the problem? So Emma asked a great question to Adam this morning. It was about pricing. And Johnny gave some good input. And I love the dialogue because Emma said, it's not that I don't believe in my value, but it's how do I set the price, right? And you know, a lot of people have opinions on this, but it's a, it's a, it's a very real thing that she's talking about. It's like, it's like me presenting to you right now. I have confidence in my slides, the content, but I might have a fear of, of public speaking. I don't, but that could be real. So with, with Emma's situation, we would have to take a look at what is that pain cause for her audience? The pain that exists if she's not there solving their problem, right? What happens if, if I go away and this continues? Are they aware that they have pain? And so in my business, if people don't know they have pain, I'm not going to even try to help them because it's like they're kicking tires. I'm not there to get my tires kicked. Dude, if you don't realize you're in pain, your teeth are in pain, nobody can help you, right? So, so what do I do? Who do I do it for? What problem am I solving? Who suffers from that problem? What pain do they have? Who owns that? That tells you who your target market is. And are they aware of their pain? And many times they're not aware of their pain. I work, a lot of my client base, believe it or not, are consultants that you would think that we are competitors. But once you get out of your mind that I'm not there to steal your business, I'm, help, I'm there to make you better so you can bring me with as a referral, then you share with me not only your pain, but your client's pain. And then we work on making them aware that they actually have pain. It's the emperor's new, uh, the emperor's, New clothes syndrome. The emperor doesn't know he's naked till you tell him, right? Then this is important. What's my first step? And what keeps me from taking my first step? And these are important answers. Sometimes you don't know your first step. Sometimes you don't know what you do. Sometimes you don't know what you want. But you always know what you don't want, what you don't want to be doing. And you usually know what's keeping you from taking your first step. We talked in Adam's session about um, waiting for perfection, waiting for the right time. That could be procrastination, hiding, fear. Fear is a great motivator. It's a motivator to stand still, right? So I'm here then to talk to you about the how-to, right? That's what I do for a living. And I want to help you get through these three steps. So I put together something that's I'm offering just for this community that if you want to take advantage of this, I would recommend you do. But if you haven't seen this graph, this is really focusing on 
this thing right here. You want to do one thing, 1% better, one day at a time. And when you do that, take a look at the outcome. 1% better each day on one skill, you have a 37.78%. I call it return on your investment. Now, if you choose to do nothing, don't read a book. Don't listen to another podcast. Don't join a community like ours. Don't get with a coach who can look at the label from the outside. And you say, well, I'm staying the same. Well, you don't stay the same. No shore remains the same. Every shore erodes. You will erode. Let's say you only erode 1%. You get 1% worse. Your return on investment drops. So you're not going to be the same in one year. So my question is, what will you be, right? So I put together what I call the individual mastery session. This is this is your first step to beginning clarity, vision, and focus. So what you can do if you'd like is you can get together with me. I can offer this. I can't offer this for my peers, but if you want to meet with someone and see if they do something like this for you. And the individual mastery sessions are this. We meet for the first time. There's no cost to that. Let's talk about the answers to your question. Let's talk about where you want to go. Is my 40 some years of experience creating better outcomes, not only for myself, but the folks that worked for me through the years and, and how we help them. And I gave discounted rates. If you look at my website, you'll see what my normal rate is. You'll see that this is something designed for our community to grow. Okay. And we will dig into your what, your why, but it's, I'm going to give you a how to. You're going to know how to. Now, if you do, that's up to you. But I believe that there's no better return on your investment than the investment you make in yourself. Now, the other thing we're doing, and I know that um, part of the session flow is to say, what else are we working on or what's exciting? That we're... So this is one thing that's exciting. I'm only offering it to our community, this individual mastery session. But if that's too much, scan the QR code. So we're rolling out online uh, education. You can learn at your own pace. You can you can log in and you can learn. This is designed for this session, for this group, how to build, maintain, and sustain a profitable small business. And I think Jeffrey's going to put the URL code in the chat, but if you like QR codes, I put it in there. Scan it. And if you don't want to spend $60, spend $9.99. That's what this cost is for this online course. But do something different than you're doing today, or you're going to end up on the red side of this curve. So I'll stop talking now, and I'd love to open it up and see what our community has to say and and uh, how I can help. Anyone? Was just promoting Jonathan to a panelist. He should be on in one second. Hey, Jonathan. Sorry about that, y'all. Hello. It's a bit of a slow transition to get someone else up as a panelist. Um, but Patrick, thank you so much for another amazing session. I so appreciate you taking the time at the beginning of this to shout out your fellow community members. And again, all of this is such a testament to like the people that we've met and the, you know, as you said, like you, you have a career on making other people's careers more successful, and you exemplified that in so many ways during this presentation. And I have some questions that we've gotten for you, and then I wanted to let everyone know if you have questions that come up during this conversation, during this Q and A, please send them to me. Please drop them in the Q and A. We'll make sure to get to them. So, Patrick, the first question I have for you is someone I also love data. I also love data. I very uh, we we look at data for different things, but it's amazing. How, how clearly numbers can translate into so much information. How do you, how do you deal, how do you help train someone to love data? Actually, I don't even try to train them to love data. What I try to do is a strength analysis for each individual. Um, so let's say, you know, you love data, but Jeffrey doesn't. And, and you task Jeffrey with, get this data, call through it, tell me what it says. Now he's going to do it. Let's say he's your employee. He's going to do it because he doesn't want to let you down because he's your employee. He's going to spend like three days on it. It might take you like three minutes. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to come back to you and you're going to go, that's not even, that's, I don't see it that way. It's not what I, so, so I, when I look at happiness gaps, I also look at it with the alignment of our team. To me, data is how you make a living, 
but to other people, it's like, it's a grind. I hate it. Right. So I'm going to try to find if, if you're the CEO, you might like data, but also you got a million other things to do. Then we have to find people on your team who can, you can offload that. So my whole premise of delegating is not dumping. Jonathan will, or Jeffrey will feel like it's been dumped on him and you'll feel like, well, I off tasked it and I delegated. So I show him, I, I trust him, but really the outcome is not what you want or what he wants. So I try to look at what people naturally are strong at, and I try to amplify that, give them more of that. So when I talk about happiness gaps, if that makes you happy, then you need to be spending about six or seven hours a day doing things like that. But then Jeffrey might be good at telling the story. He's not good at telling what the story is from the data, but he's good at communicating that story to groups. And you might not be. So he needs to spend all day doing that. So then when you come to him and say, Hey, Jeffrey, I pulled all this data. Trust me, it's there. Here's the story. I need you to go tell that story. So now what Jeffrey does is he says, oh my God, Jonathan's the best boss in the world because he gives me, I call them, you know, one through 10. He gives me my seven to tens all the time. And you go, whew, that's a three on my list. I'm glad I don't have to do that. And then the hidden part, the opportunity cost that we're not thinking about is Jeffrey tells his friends who are just like him, I have the best place I work. This leads to staffing. Jonathan never has to hire anybody because staff comes flying in. Yeah. And he and what do people do when they're when they're telling people about where they work? I would never say, hey, Jonathan, come work at my company because we pay great, but the job sucks. The boss is a dick. Yeah. You know, the, the coworkers are backstabbing, blah, 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 blah. No, you describe all these seven to tens. So what you're creating then is a culture that spreads like wildfire because you delegate. So it's hard to get someone to love data if they don't love data. Yeah. Right. So I just try to immerse people in what they do love. And then if they're curious and they say, I'd love, like to get better at that, like Jonathan, then we have to give them baby steps. Cause it, if it isn't natural, it's like, it's like switching the hand you write with. Totally. It doesn't look the same, but you could still write. Yeah. I really appreciate that that approach. I think that's obviously, you know, we know you know what you're talking about, but it's so I love the approach of doing a strength analysis of this idea of saying it's not necessarily that this is a weakness of yours as much as it's where I'm not trying to fit you in this specific box that I've defined as success. I'm trying to say there is an avenue for success for you. We have to identify what that main strength is so that when you invest time in it, we know that you're you're, you know, acting to your strengths. And then even that idea of recognizing that, and I think this is also so important, and this is something that's come up in a few of our conversations that we've had during this 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 whole week, um, is like that recognition that there are hard skills that you can't just learn, right? That right. the idea of like taking a risk is easier said than done. Some people, you just like, it takes a while to get there. Learning to love data, it's one thing to say, I'm going to hire you for this role and this is data, so now you have to do this. And it's right. another thing to just recognize Yes, this is a skill to learn, but first you have to unlearn something to get there, which is what I love looking yeah. at it as right or left-handed. I can want to write with my left hand all I want. It doesn't matter. I have to train my mind and body to know that that is okay and to learn how to do that. And right. it's, it's just makes perfect sense to think about that in, in larger skills as well and hard skills and soft skills with finding a way, you know, to work with professionals and to set them up to succeed. I, that, that's such an... A, a proactive and empathetic approach. And I think that's such a great, you know, a, a, people can apply that to so many different parts of their life. Right, um, right. Well, and, and better outcomes. I mean, my situation growing up was unique to me. Not everybody has that. Yeah. And people, and people have it worse than me. And I honestly, you know, people say, um, would you change that? I'm like, well, then I wouldn't be who I am today if I did. So I guess I'd have to say, no, I wouldn't change because I learned a lot. But I also was of the mindset I could learn. And there's some humility you talked about it earlier today, like leave the ego at the door. And, you know, ego is two things. So one of it is boastful and not listening and closed minded. The other is that your ego is designed um, to protect you as a person. And it knows your fears and it knows your doubts and it knows when you might get into trouble. So it's always telling you don't. And that's OK. But if you want a better outcome and believe me, the pain I was in had to be so unbearable that I wanted to change because change is painful. Yeah. And that's the beauty of what I do is I tell people the, the beautiful thing is you're not going to be alone because I kind of project manage you. I project manage the outcome we're after and you're not alone. And I can tell you that 90% of my consultant business is repeat. People come back because it works. 
Because yeah. it works to have somebody who owns that process and gets you there when you feel like you can't. Yeah. Accountability. It's, yeah. It really is. It's accountability. And that's what's, I forget. I think it was, I don't know who's, I think it was a OG GoDaddy founder who said, uh, or or someone said something about if you measure it, it will grow. This idea that anything that you measure, whatever you measure grow. grows, whatever you feed will grow. So yeah, we feed I, we yeah we feed behaviors all the time. Yeah. Again, mindset. I mean, if you believe everything you need is out there, you know, people look at the law of attraction and lots of different things. I've I've discovered for myself, everything I've ever needed is really out there. I don't create anything. Um, it's all there for me. So if you believe that then nothing is impossible. And, and that's the that's the secret to better outcomes is that we stop defining for ourselves. So when I when I was in the infantry, we went through um, escape and evasion training and those that got captured and were held prisoner had a bag over their head and were you know scared and frightened and held for a while and told what would happen to them if they tried to escape and blah, blah, blah. And we were told what would happen to them if we tried to break them out. And when the whole thing ended, they brought everybody out and you know, what did you learn? What did you learn? And here's the number one thing we all learned as the people being captured by the Rangers. The doors weren't locked. There was nobody standing guard. The camp was empty. We never tried to open the door. We let ourselves be tied to that chair with a bag over our head. Never once trying to just open the door or walk out. Fear is self-limiting. Everything yeah. can be so, so outcomes. We can already define why we won't do something. What's that first step? But we'll tell you a million, million reasons why we won't take that first step. Yeah, right. That's amazing. I, I, my next question for you, and this is you, you kind of touched on this already, but I, I'd love to hear you unpack it a little further. Is how do you how what would you say to someone who has? Because one thing that I appreciate about you so much is you are so aware of your background, you are so aware of your upbringing, and you you use that you use that as fodder to be better. You learn from it, and you use that to again to help your clients. What would you how would you, what advice would you give to someone about learning to take times of of change, times of strife, and you know cr create gold out of it? Well, how, how do you, how do you tell someone, how do you help someone see that there is learnings to be had in the difficult times? I mean, that's, it's hard because I am, I am a big fan that you can't discover something for somebody else. Right. So I, I don't try to talk somebody into that, but I'll use you as an example. When I first met you, a lot of your conversation was about the student loan debt you had. And you didn't say, Hey, my solution to that." is going to be create a million followers and I'll use my dog and I'll write these books and I'll be on the today show. That was never, that was not where you came from. So your, your activities with your dog create an outcome because you did it without any pretense. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think the main thing that I, I start with people in that respect is first of all, to embrace the fact that you are miserable, you might be miserable. It's okay to even cry about it. It's okay to say, I don't know where to go. Sometimes these sessions I have with people, for, so first of all, I don't cut back on the value because of the price I give you. And I don't cut back on the value because of the time I give you. And many times I say 30 minutes and we're there for an hour and a half because I don't move forward till you're ready. Because I, if I project manage and I say, well, time's up, I'm not going to have 90% repeat business, right? Yeah. So we have to go through it together. You have to find someone you trust. You can't go through it alone. That's why we have this community. That's why we have the meetups every other week. Because many times we do actually shed a tear or two. We do talk about things. And when people say, well, that's my personal life. I haven't yet to meet the person who can unpack their personal life and then their professional life and compartmentalize everything. Yeah. One affects the other. Totally. I don't care who, yeah. So, so the whole thing about helping folks get past that is first of all, acknowledge where you are and be willing to stand in your pain longer. Don't be in a rush. If people put a timeline, like when, when did we start the focus? When did we start the you, 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 clarity? Come, clarity doesn't come quickly. <laughs> Patrick, yeah. I literally, my next question for you is what do you say to your clients who aren't willing to be patient? That was oh, literally well, I, have, I have a lot. Of, I have a lot of them who, are, if you don't mind, by the way, it's so it's like 75 degrees in Chicago. No, take, I, get into it, Patrick. Get I'm, bring, it, I'm bringing yeah. sexy back. Yeah, I'm bringing sexy back. <laughs> um, yeah, no, a lot of my clients, they start with an impatience and they'll be like, well, how long does this take? Or what's this going to cost me? 
And again, I try to go back to what does it cost you now if you do nothing? What are your pain points? And I don't say what's your pain point, but I'll say, have you quantified the cost of the problem you have? Have you quantified the cost if you let this continue for another three months or six months? Now, the customers I love, I had a customer come to me and her words were, my company's spiraling out of control. Okay, there's nowhere but up to go. I'm going to look like a hero. But the people who are like, why should I work with you? I'm like, well, okay, we'll have a conversation. I'm gonna ask you like six questions. And then if you're not saying to yourself, why haven't I worked with you? Then you really don't know your pain yet. There's no, there's no process that's perfect. There's no company that's perfect. People resist uh, consultants because I'll tell you why. There's a bunch of jamokes out there who call themselves a consultant and they want to get their next paycheck and they rip somebody off and they make it hard for anybody else. Mm -hmm. So when you, it's like finding a good barber or a good tailor or a good anything else. When you find a good one or a good chef, you know, when you find one, you go back to them and you go back over and over again. You know, if you don't find that or you can't relate with somebody on a personal level, then you're never going to relate with them on a professional level. Yeah. And here's the thing. You need to look for people with wisdom and wisdom comes from experience. So if these people have not gotten the shit beat out of them by the world, they're not going to be able to help you when the world's beating the shit out of you. That's yeah. plain and simple. Totally. And and it, it also boils down to you know, I, I I keep coming back to like finding a good, and Johnny brought this up. This was something that Johnny talked about was finding a good tax person. Yeah. That same thing of being like, there are people who will provide the service, but what are they right. actually going to do for you, right? You right. find a person who has the experience whose, whose success is not, did I complete a KPI, but the success is, did you achieve the thing that you came to me to do? And that is, such, again, that's such an important way to approach any, you know, any business that you might have, anyone who works with clients would do well to remember that and to sit yeah. there and go, the bottom line is this person is coming to you to solve one of their problems. They're not right. here to solve one of your problems. Right. And that is such an amazing, again, it's just such a thoughtful approach to helping people and empowering them to succeed on their own terms and saying, right. you have the tools. You just don't know what they are and you don't know how to use them. And That's just, exactly right, Jonathan. It's like having a hammer and you're using it like a screwdriver. I mean, yeah. the, you know, the, the, the key to empower, you know, empowering somebody is making them realize they're holding a hammer in their hand, right? And so, you know, those that, that come and say, you know, what's it cost or how much time? I mean, I appreciate that. So usually I try to reframe the question and I'll say something along the lines of, it sounds like you're looking for help, but you want to make sure it fits within your budget. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And they'll say, yeah. Or they'll say, no, what I really mean is this, but they'll clarify that. And the other thing that, that I caution people about when they, especially if they are going to work with a coach is um, if the coach gets defensive because you ask them questions, I mean, a question is not an attack, right? And, and, and so a question is curiosity. A question is interest. And people may not have worked with a coach before or worse yet, they've worked with a coach and they turn out to be a bust. Yeah. So, but I, the point is what I tried to give you today is not, come hire me as your coach. I'd love it, but that's that's not what I'm after. But answer those questions for yourself. If you can answer them on your own, more power to you. Keep going. You'll be fine. Totally. But if you're getting outcomes or getting stuck or getting in a place where you don't want to be, you may need some help. And it may be the community. It may be a podcast you listen to. It may be whatever it may be. But there are so many resources. When I was going through all this, I was by myself. There was no internet. Like I said, there's no college tours. I was the only one in my family to go to college. I didn't even have somebody to ask, what's college like? I didn't know college could be a really big party. Um, <laughs> you know, All I knew was Ronald Reagan was the president. I was joining the infantry because they were the only ones going to pay for college. And that was my way to get out of yeah. what I was in for all those years. And that wasn't easy because there's a lot of emotion attached to the people you're doing this for or with. And I went through with this feeling of I'm being selfish by trying to take care of myself, but I had to. Yeah. to get to a better place. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, thank goodness you did. Like, yeah. it's, you know, it boils down to thank goodness you did. And you have that, you had that clarity of mind to say, you know, again, talk about taking risks and going through change. Like you right. are, you can, and wisdom, right? And you're good at what you do because you've lived it. And you not only do you, you know, talk the talk, you walk the walk and you do it all. And that's something that not every consultant has. So that's something that not everyone, like, again, it, is able to deliver on. And there are people who work in this who don't have that experience yet. Right. And it's just important to, I feel like it just must be important to remember that and to sit there and go, don't tell someone that you can accomplish something for them if you know you can't. 
Don't do right. it for the sake of getting their business if you know you're going to upset them or you're going to fail because, as you said, it's all about community. It's word of mouth, right? You right. get people talking about how helpful you are, and that's how you get a client for life. That's how you get those 90% returns, right? Is right, exactly. 90% of people aren't coming back because they aren't sure what you're doing. That's not how any, that's not how any business works. Right. Um, that's exactly right. Yep. All right. I got, I got a few more questions for you, Patrick. We only got sure. about 10 more minutes left. Okay. Um, thank you for, oh, thank you for answering all of these though. Um, next question for you is going back uh, to um, your, uh, the three steps, clarity, vision, and focus. What would you say, where do people have the biggest, where do, where do most people struggle in transitioning? Is it going from one to the other? Uh, and which one is that? So, um, I break those apart so I can use that as a frame of reference for people when I'm coaching them so they understand the task they're working on. So they, because many times they want to move right to like vision statement, mission, this is what we do, blah, blah, blah. So, and the other, where people fail is they don't realize they're fluid, right? So the image of that foggy bridge, if you imagine you're on that bridge with me, Jonathan, we're standing next to each other, we've come this far now, we're standing there, we're looking at this foggy bridge. And I look at you, I say, well, what do you want to do? So you have three choices. Let's go back to where we have been because we know that. Let's stand still or let's go forward, right? So in my life, I could have stayed with what I knew because many times we'll stay in a bad situation because we're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. We know that monster, the unknown, joining the army at 17 years old. Then the day you get out of the army, going to college, you don't know what college is like, Right. Somebody else enrolls you, so you don't even know what the, you don't know anything about it. There's a lot of fear in the unknown. Yeah. It's more comfortable just to stay put, right? So we'll talk about those choices then, and we'll say, well, here's the, here's the choices with all three options. Go back, stand still, go forward. But as we start deciphering, the fog clears a little bit, right? So then we're moving from a clarity to a vision. We can see a little further down the road. There is a bridge beyond the fog. It's not just a, fo a bridge that falls off a cliff. Let's move to that point. And then as the fog clears more, then you get focused. Let's focus in. So if we do this in a business and someone agrees that at any time when you're crossing the bridge, the fog could blow back in. Old habits com could come back. You could turn around and start facing what you know. And my job is to help turn you back around, stay put, look around, clear the fog. So the fluidity of it. And so I think people get tied up. It's like strategy and tactics. You know, if, if you and I are driving in a car and we say, we're going to drive from Chicago to Florida and I'm the driver and then you blindfold me, that doesn't change my strategy and yours. We have to get to Florida. But my tactics, the speed I drive, the directions I turn, the brakes I use, those change. But I have to get... So the same thing happens. So people get tighter on all of them. I've got four seatbelts on and a helmet <laughs> and I just won't <laughs> let you take the blindfold off. I won't let you right. do it. So when we break it into discussion topics and we, and I put it in, and listen, you could take those three, you could make them 10, you can make them all into one. People who want to get tied up in the definition of that's really vision or that's really clarity. They're not there to learn. They're there to, to let me know what they know. Yeah. The best people who learn drop what they know and learn what they don't know. So that, so I use those three steps as honestly discussion points. Great. No, I, that's, I mean, again, it's, it's so wonderful to, to say like, this is not about you have to fit into this specific box. Yeah. It's not a it's, science. It's not a yeah. science. It's more art than yeah, it is we're going science. To accommodate you. You are an individual person. This is a formula I have, and it is able to adapt for the person I'm working with. And Absolutely. That's, and that's so key to know you can't put all of your clients in one box. They're going to be different. They're going to want different things and being able to pivot and accommodate that yeah. is, so, is such a strength of yours. Yeah, well, well, a lot of my clients, they want to know that I know how to do it. They don't want to know how to do it. They just want to know that I know how to. Yeah, no, you're going back to taxes. Exactly. <laughs> Go back to taxes. <laughs> you know what you're doing. And I just, I, the and that I, I, I keep going back to community. If someone trusts you and you have a relationship with them, I do know how to do it because I've got a guy who knows exactly what he's talking about. And we both know that we are there for each other. And he's got my back. That like that kind of empowerment. I can't even imagine how 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 much better your clients feel knowing that they have someone in their back pocket who's going to keep them on the straight and narrow. That's, that's yeah. The worst part about the worst part about this is when working with an individual when they start looking around at others, 
and they lose focus on what is what they're after. You know, it'd yeah. be very easy at the time you were becoming um, a sensation. It was a time I was launching my book and I'm thinking, God, how do I get a million followers? That's the absolute wrong thing for me to do. It took my eye off my own prize. I had to I had to refocus. I, I didn't necessarily do that, but that that is a temptation. Or somebody got 300 likes and I got two. Yeah, we're looking at the wrong things. We're looking yeah. we're looking at the wrong rewards. So rewards are an important thing. Mark Twain was it Mark Twain? Co comparison is the death of joy. Absolutely. That whole I mean again like it's it's and it's it's important to like learn from your competitors, right? There's there's the uh, there's the comparison in the sense of like, I'm going to try and distill information from this. And then there's the comparison of one is good, one is bad, and it's black and white like that. And that, that's just not how the world works. Not at all. So we got uh, one more question for you, Patrick. Uh, what, and again, this, I feel like we could sit here for a long time, but how would you go about uh, oh, no, you know what? I'm going to go this way. What is the best way to gain clarity when you are starting a business if you're not sure how to put your skills to use for others? Yeah, and and I love the last part of that question, putting your skills to use for others, which at the heart of it is problem solving, right? Mm -hmm. So clarity, if you go back to those first questions, what is it you do? Who do you do it for? So I went through this with my coach when I began writing my book, and that was he pinned me down on that and we actually spent like three weeks and I thought I answered the question, but it wasn't, I wasn't clear. Well, who, who is this book for? Not only what will it do? Talk present tense. What are they doing with your book? Where is your book during the workday? Who do they tell about your book? How does it impact their business? So drilling deep into for clarity, what you do, who you do it for. And each one of these, each one of these questions has levels of clarity, has levels of vision, has uh, levels of focus. So who owns the problem? Being crystal clear on that. If you say, well, I mean, everybody owns the problem, then nobody owns the problem. Right. You know, and so you have to, you have to really drill into that. And, and again, you know, find a way, usually an outside source. And I always recommend the people, I love like-minded people, but not when I'm trying to fix myself. I want people to tell me the hard truth, whether I like yeah. to hear it or not. Yeah, I'm really good at correcting. I'm not good at hearing it the first time, but I do hear it. <laughs> and so right. that's we are the thing. So the same. We are cut from the same. Everybody is, Jonathan. You're not alone. That's the beauty of it is that nobody's alone. Somebody's gone through this before you. There's somebody who can help you. Clarity is all about asking the right questions, asking the tough questions, and not moving forward till you're absolutely dead sure that's the answer and then you double and triple check it and so sometimes what do you want i reverse it what don't you want yeah people always say well i want to make more money no i mean that's okay that's a given but yeah. what are you looking for in an employer i just went through shock, this shock surprise surprise <laughs> right 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 but that's wonderful that you redirect right you take that and you go right i know the goal is to make money just like with any launching any business right the goal is to be able to sustain the business ultimately right. the goal of launching a business is that the business can be launched and succeed right. but that right. can't be the only thing you're out to do right it has to right. you also have to be able to sit there and go you know what i know what i'm talking about i know this service is valuable and i'm going to lean on my community for that and i'm going to get yeah. i'm going to get active in this space i'm going to i'm going to learn i'm going to ask questions and i you know again like it, it's it goes back to the ego, right? I hear it. I'm not always great about hearing it the first time, but I do hear it. That mm -hmm. alone is such an important thing to sit there and go, right. you know, like me, I'm one of those people where I can give so much advice and I can't take it. I right. cannot take the advice that I give, but I, I, anytime I do that, I sit there and I take stock of it. And it's a very humbling moment to be able to sit there and do that. I can imagine that any small business owner who has the clarity of mind to recognize their own strengths and their own, you know, seven to tens is, are the people who are going to be able to stay above water. And there's so many ways to go about doing that. Well, the main thing is that nobody should confuse momentary frustration for a lifelong passion. Yeah. And I, I can't tell you how many people, I hate my boss, I've always wanted to have my own business. And they believe having your own business means you have bags of money laying around your house. Exactly. And, you know, you have to get them past the momentary frustration, which is sometimes a catalyst to step past fear. Sometimes that's the catalyst to take the first step, but you haven't thought through it with clarity, vision, and focus. So I believe that. Patrick, thank you so much 
for taking the time to chat with us and our community today. I, I again, like this, I'm so glad that these are all recorded because there's so much, there's so much that you've said that's so unbelievably valuable. And again, you're such a leader in your space and you're a leader in this space as well. And it means so much to have you uh, share your knowledge with us. And I know that as we continue to share out these videos and this content, it's only gonna continue uh, uh, to create uh, important conversations. And again, it, you are such a testament to this community. And um, thank you so, so much for your time. Patrick, before we all go, uh, tell us if people are interested in reaching out. I know you've said this already, but, uh, and and Jeffrey dropped the uh, your link uh, in the chat, but uh, if you could just let us know how we could stay in touch with you, how we can follow along and tell us one uh, fun thing that you're looking forward to, one project you're working on. So you can connect with me in this group. So join the GoDaddy group if you're not in. Connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm active there. I love uh, discussions and conversations with with our folks. Um, I'm really, really excited about all the stuff that we talked about in my business, uh, but I'm more excited about seeing my two grandchildren this coming summer. So, oh my gosh, oh, yeah. baby girl, baby boy. So. Are they coming out? Well, they, I, hopefully, but we're going there if they don't come to us. So <laughs> through hell or high water, exactly. Oh, that's fabulous. How again, the important things, man. The important things to look forward to. Well, sure. Patrick, thank you again so so much for your time. This has been a wonderful, wonderful hour. I hope you all have a wonderful day today. Please make sure uh, to join us tomorrow morning as we continue our series. Uh, tomorrow at ten a.m., we are starting off strong with Udo Gray. I hope to see you all there.